I want to start by, by dedicating my talk to uh, Father Malachy. I've been going to Mepkin Abbey for 13 some odd years. And what I used to do was I used to work in their eggery. They had 40,000 chickens and they would harvest these eggs. And I've done every job there is, I think, on the in the monastery. But primarily I was working what's what in the grading house or the eggery that they call it. And while I was doing this, there was a, a, a monk named Father Malachy who worked with me. And Father Malachy um, was definitely in his 80s at the time. And he made the boxes. And all the time that I was working, I got to know Father Malachy little by little. And he was a very, very mild-mannered, uh, bearded guy. He was a, uh, a priest, obviously. and. Uh, and he was, came across as a very, very simple man, very, very simple, humble, humble guy. And I asked him one time, for example, I said, Father Malachy, why don't you say Mass anymore? Because uh, he never said Mass in the morning. And he said, oh, he said, uh, I went to the abbot and asked him if I didn't, so I wouldn't have to say, he said, I really can't think of anything to say for the homilies. Um, so he asked to be relieved. And another time, you know, I said, I noticed, and this is another reason why the monastery is very confrontational, is I said, Father Malachi, I said, I noticed that you eat two ice creams every time there's ice cream served in the refectory. He said, well, he said, I used to eat three. <laughs> he, he said, but then the abbot said to me, he said, Father Malachi, do you really think that a man your age should be eating three ice creams? He said, so now I only eat two. And uh, that, was the, that was the kind of guy he was, and that's how I had him pegged. And then one day, he told me that the monastery had got a big shipment of books on, on theology written in French. And the abbot had asked him to uh, go through these books, uh, get a general idea of what they were all about, and then write a synopsis so that they could go into the monastery library. And Father Malachy, in his same way, says, he said, the abbot thought I spoke French, but I didn't. But he's so busy that I didn't mention it to him. <laughs> I just stayed up late for a couple of months, taught myself French, read the books, wrote the summaries. He said, I never said anything to anyone. And I really believe to this day that I'm the only person that knows that story. Guess what? I changed my opinion a little bit of this guy. I later found out that um, most of the monks go to him for went to him for confession uh, because of the deep insight and stuff that, uh, that, he, that he brought to the discussions that they would have about their personal lives. And then most amazingly, uh, one day, uh, you know, I got, just got word that Father Malachi had died. And so I rushed down to the monastery for the funeral. And Father Francis Klein, the most amazing guy probably that I've ever met in my life, who was the abbot down there, um, was giving the funeral oration. And he said that he said that, you know, he felt sick. So he took him to the hospital, and the test came back within 24 hours and said he's full of cancer. He said, and it was my job to go over there and tell him. They had weeks, or a week, I think he died in a week. And um, he said, I went over there, and I sat down with him, and I told him, and he just looked at me and he said, oh, that's all right. And he reached out and he stroked, and Father Francis, the only time I ever saw him do that, he just came apart on the, on the altar. Uh, that very, very emotional. And afterwards, probably one of the greatest things that ever happened to me was that, uh, Brother Stan, who's now the abbot at the monastery, walked up to me and he said, the brothers would like you to carry the crucifix for his funeral procession. Um, and that's how close we've become. And so I wanted to tell you that story. And the final thing I wanted to mention is I said something to, the, um, to one of the monks about the way he died, comforting Francis. And he said, yeah, he said, that's, I understand that. He said, uh, he, then he started to walk away and he looked over his shoulder at me and he says, you know, 
Everybody wants to die like a Trappist. Nobody wants to live like one. So to me, the reason I wanted to dedicate this and start out with Father Malachy is because that whole story, especially about the French, um, learning French in two months, um, rather than trouble the abbot with the information that he doesn't speak French, but the ability of an 80-year-old man to master French in two months. And by the way, staying up a little late at, mon at the monastery, when you go to bed at 8 o'clock at night, you get up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, it's not my idea of, uh, of, of recreation either. Um, but to me, that passion, that commitment, that drive, that motivation is what, over time, as I spent more and more time down there, began because I'm a businessman began to really, and I started looking around, and here were these guys, 70 years old on average, living in silence, working four hours a day. They manage thousands of acres of land. They have 40,000 chickens. Now they have, a, they've gotten out of that business, they're getting into the mushroom business. They sell fertilizers. They have timber that they take care of. They have they were loose gardens down there because the land was a, was a gift from the looses. Beautiful, spectacular gardens on the Cooper River. They take care of that. They have like 12 or 13 guest houses that they have to keep maintained meticulously. They have their own infirmary where they take care of, talk about health care, they take care of their own in the, in the infirmary. Um, they have a, their own conference center, they have a library, they have a gift shop, and you got 20 guys, average age 70, working four hours a day in silence. What is their secret?